Today's podcast is sponsored by Fire Facilities Incorporated, expert engineers, designers, and manufacturers of steel training towers, burn rooms, and mobile units that are all made in the USA. Another one for me, one of my biggest biggest things that I can't wrap my head around, but it makes me so proud to be a firefighter is I, I my big thing is Patty Brown, Patty Brown from FDNY. And mm-hmm. when yep. I, I just can't help, but when I think about it, he is in my industry or he was in my industry, I have, I am a firefighter. He's a firefighter that melts my brain. Sometimes I'm like, I'm in the same job as that guy. And that guy gave it all. I literally gave it all. Yeah. And uh, that to me just, just warps my brain, man. I'm like, I cannot believe I do the same job. Now I'm not saying I do it as well or to the level, yeah. but if there's a spectrum and I'm on the bottom and he's on the top, at least I'm there. But uh, so this, this, this is really Chief Thompson's story and I, and I screw it up every time, but so he used to ride out with, with fire departments back in the day when he, you know, he was still a fireman and he rode out and I think it was rescue four in New York. And, I always forget this this guy's name, but he's you know he's talking to this 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 captain on the rescue, and he's like, man, well, I don't even know what I'm doing here. And this this captain in New York tells him, he goes, you you can, oh my god, uh, you can be a firefighter at the highest level at the time. I think Chief Thompson was in Plano. You can be a, a firefighter at the highest level in Plano, Texas, as you can be here. It's just going to look a little bit different. And he, he told that story, but you know, I've, I've kind of been around in my whole career, but the first time I heard that story, man, that really, you know, resonated with me, man. Like just because I'm, I'm working in suburban Dallas, you know, doesn't mean that I can't be a firefighter at the highest level. And yeah, dude, dude's like Patty Brown, Patty Brown's still in the fire service. He, he's, he still is. He, he's, he's not gone. He's still in the fire service. All those guys are still in the fire service. Their legacy will live forever. Um, and yeah, dude, I, I, I have the, I have those same thoughts. Like that dude did the same job that I do, and yeah, just yeah. I, I don't it's, even, it's hard. It's I, hard. I, to I lose. Your, I lose. I lose yeah, words. No, no. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to wrap your mind around. Yep. We, t- we we talked a little bit about attitude, um, and, and no. we've talked about you, you're gonna have good attitude, bad attitude, but I think there's a general attitude people have or don't have in the fire service. So there's a group that I call the T-shirt bumper sticker crowd where. They come to work. Mm-hmm. They don't do anything extra. They do the bare minimum. They bitch about the bare minimum. But off duty, they wear their T-shirts and have bumper stickers on the trucks because they want everybody to know they're a firefighter. Drives me up a wall. Yeah. But I don't think people like that can really change. I think their attitude as such is what can the fire service give me as opposed to people like you and me. We're like, what can we give the fire service? Because I'm of the opinion, my attitude is such the fire service doesn't owe me anything. Not one thing. I owe the fire service absolutely everything. No. Where do you think attitude fits in, uh, in along that those lines? Man, so, like, I think that attitude can be changed. Like, um, tell you how you change it is you tell that guy he can't be a firefighter anymore, man. Because I'm, you know, again, I you know, kind of touched on it before we started the conversation today. You know, I got my career reset about 12 years ago. And I was I was told by a fire chief, hey, you can't work there anymore. And I wasn't necessarily the T-shirt and bumper sticker club. I was, you know, trying to be a good firefighter, as as good as I knew how to be. Um, but when you realize, hey, man, this is like I'm not a fireman right now. Um, and you know, I sent a land speed record from being resigned from a fire department. I was afforded the opportunity to seek employment elsewhere. Um, but to uh, to start your career over and to get back to the level that you were. Um, yeah, man, there's that, that will definitely reignite your passion. Um, and I, man, I just I didn't have, I said I didn't have. I had role models around me. I didn't even realize that, that that I had like some some absolute studs that were raising me. Um, and nobody had that conversation with me. Like, you know, nobody called me out. Hey, do you realize you're just a t-shirt and sticker fireman? I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to drop That's that up on. Right. But uh, but but I've I've worked with those guys in the past and. You know, the, a lot of times they just never, like, I didn't know what the fire service, you know, had to offer outside of my little world. So I worked in, you know, small departments outside the Metroplex 
and all you had to do to promote this one department was take a test. Um, it wasn't required that you went out and get any education. It wasn't required that you took any classes. You didn't, you know, the, it was still kind of, you know, pre, pre 9-11. Um, it, well, I mean, it was 2010, all that stuff down, but there weren't like conferences to go to. I didn't realize that I sucked. Like I didn't know what I didn't yeah. know. Right. And after that is when I realized, man, like I went to go to the, work in this other department, you know, 12 years in the fire service. I was still, you know, in Texas, we had different levels, you know, firefighter, basic, intermediate, advanced and master. And I was 12 years in the fire service and I was still a firefighter, you know, basic. I had one, one level A class outside of that. And I'm kind of looking around and realizing, dude, you were an absolute stack of crap, man. And so went right back and, you know, enrolled in college, started taking every class I could get my hands on, um, worked in this, it was a, a smaller department that, uh, you know, that, that kind of picked me up after all that stuff went down and then stayed there for, for a few years. And then I'm, you know, wound up in the colony, you know, I say wound up, I intentionally went to the colony. Um, and from there, you know, it's kind of taken off, but I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I didn't, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, those guys, you know, your t-shirt and bumper sticker guys, you can fix them. Like, you know, if you can show them a world outside of the little world that they know, man, bring those, bring those guys in. If you get that guy out to a conference and, 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 you know, model for them what it's supposed to look like, then I think you can change those guys. You know, I'd love to believe you. I really hope that's the case. I just, the, there's a few that I'm thinking of that, I mean, just, I don't know. They're just, not everybody's supposed to be a firefighter. I really don't think, I really believe that, that not everybody, you may want to be. Oh, I believe you know, that. But, yeah. you know, I've had these, well, I don't know. I, it, that, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, oh, yeah, no, we can spend, we can spend hours going over that. I mean, that's, that's a whole thing. But so I had a, I heard a fire chief say that you can't teach aggression one time. You can't teach aggression. And I don't know that it's that so much that we can't teach aggression so much as like, I didn't know how aggressive I could be until somebody showed me. So, you know, again, somebody literally, somebody pulled up a video, Hey, you can do this. Are you, I'm like, are you shitting me right now? Like I can throw like, I turned it into a channel. We, we watched some video. I wish I could remember where it's from, but uh, this guy's, you know, he's the OC on this fire. Um, takes the back door, sweeps inside, throws almost every ladder that's on their ladder truck on this fire by himself. I mean, literally run. I like, hold a second. I can do that. Like you're, you're giving, you're green lighting me to go do that. Oh dude, I can be this. Yeah, absolutely. And so they kind of showed me what it can look like. I'm like, Roger that, man, let's get after it. And so, you know, the, can that, can you make something else out of that guy? Like, I think you know, if you can get that guy to buy in and show him what it looks like, I hope that you can change those guys. Well, going back to your story earlier about the person that was calling you because, you know, he, he was in the street and he was so excited. Um, one thing for me that was kind of a, I didn't know this was going to happen, but I was, when I first got promoted to the training officer position, uh, we had to do physical agility one Saturday morning. And so it was just something I had to do. Well, I get there and there's a couple hundred people giving it their all. I mean, because they know this is their one shot. And I was getting kind of yeah. stoked. I was getting like, man, I was watching certain people that were doing superhuman things with fire equipment and because yeah. they wanted to make their mark on the fire department. And I saw that. I, it just took me back to where when I was transitioning out of a military firefighter into civilian how hard I worked for my one shot to get on Lexington fire department in yeah. Kentucky. And I mean, I yeah. was all day, all day throwing ladders, pulling hose, everything. And it, you know, it just kind of reignited that passion for me a little bit that, cause sometimes you don't know that your passion's gone. You really don't until it gets reignited again. Cause it's not like you do a passion yeah. check every day. Cause it can degrade over time. <laughs> yeah. no, you're not gonna wake up and yeah, go, okay, no. I love this damn job. It's just, it just doesn't. But then you'll see and do things that are going to just remind you how awesome and uh, a job is and how lucky we are to have it. Uh, yeah. So this, uh, oh, let's talk about education fire service. I said we're going to talk about this. You, you talked about get, getting your okay. degree. So I've heard a lot of negatives about education in the fire service. When I say education, I mean higher learning, college degrees. Um, and if you go on to certain colleges that support the fire service and read their comments. There's a lot of hate there. What are your thoughts about no. higher education in the fire service? 
So it's a blue collar job. All right. There's, there is a, you know, associate's degree required to be a tailboard fireman, driver, officer. I, I don't believe so. I, I really did the education stuff for my own self just to make myself better. Actually, honestly, I did it because um, with the way my, uh, my, my deal went down where my career got reset, I told myself I'm going to put myself in a position that where if my situation were to go down again, it's going to go differently for somebody else. Um, so you know, I have aspirations for, you know, admin much further down my career. I'm still, you know, relatively young. I'm 45 in the body of a 70 year old, but I'm going to keep going <laughs> as long as I can go. Um, but, you know, when you start getting into to, to management role, does, does that degree really help you as a manager? Man, I, I'm not impressed with education in the fire service. Um, again, my, my, I did it on my own. It was just just to better my own self. But by by all means, I'm I, I don't I don't need my captain to have you know any kind of degree. Now, you know, a battalion chief, division chief, assistant chief, I could see where that education comes into play. Um, you know, and and that they're gonna there's departments that are gonna be looking for that. You know, I I would like to have a guy that can conjugate a verb when he's writing policies that. That you know that are supposed to keep me and my guys alive, or you know when they're going to a council chamber to negotiate, you know how much they're going to pay us or get you know get equipment for us. Um, a guy that's you know educated and can and can speak as such. Those are handy to have in those in those positions. But as as far as you know pulling lines, you know throwing ladders, dragging people out of buildings. Yeah, I'm, I'm not real impressed with the degree at that level. You know, I, I agree with you. I really do. Um, I don't think that it's necessary, but I do think it makes better firefighters. Um, I'm like you. I did it for uh, just for me. Uh, I got an associate's in general studies, and then I got a, ma a master. I got a, a bachelor's in fire protection administration. And I've never really wanted to be part of the admin. That's never been my goal. I fell bass backwards into yeah. tr a training officer or admin position. And that's when I decided to get that part of the degree. But even then, I don't think it's all that necessary, but I want to go back to what you said about a blue collar job. That's where I'm going to disagree with you. So back in the day, and I'm talking 30 years ago, this was strictly a blue collar job. We do blue collar things, but I think we're a light blue collar job. So we're not white collar. We're not blue collar. And let me explain what I'm saying. If you go to a doctor, your general doctor, and you got something seriously wrong, they don't fix you. They send you to another doctor, Right. You go to a dentist, mm -hmm. you got something really wrong with your tooth, they send you to a specialized person that deals with that in ortho surgery. We're not that way. We have to do everything under one umbrella. We're the most intelligent and professional group of people I think there is. So do we run into burning buildings? Yes. What about paramedics that run into burning buildings? These guys are learning medications on the fly, stuff, advanced life support, you know, pediatric advanced life support. Uh, then you've got technical yeah. support. You got you got ropes. You got confined space. Driver operator to me is the most technical and one of the most important jobs on the fire ground. Nobody else can do their job unless the the driver operator does their job. So that's my spiel. I don't think we're blue collar anymore. We do blue collar work, but I think the fire department, the fire service as a whole, is one of the most intelligent professional industries. Period. That's why I call them the light blue collar workers. No, I. I still agree slash disagree. Um, <laughs> you you can you can have a degree and still yeah. be an idiot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I know I know plenty of those. So you could you could send a guy my associate's degree um, in in fire science technology um, has not yet taught me how to read smoke and definitely didn't tell me you know teach me force splintery techniques. Um, so there's I, again I. Did, has it made me a better firefighter? Yes. And that maybe I think a little bit deeper about some things outside of the realm of actually the, the work that we do as far as the hands on really more in the management side of it or, you know, in the uh, philosophical side of the fire service. Um, but as far as you know, the, the grunt work that we're doing, you know, I, I, it's more to me, that's more trade school than it is, you know, degree oriented. Man, if they gave me a degree in search and forceful entry, did I take that class? <laughs> doctor, doctor phrase. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I would be pursuing my doctorate from FSU. 
F, F, F shoot up university for uh, uh, my boy Heaney down in Austin. What is but, in uh, Texas? What is yeah. it? I meant to ask you, what in the heck is in the water of Texas? Some of the best firefighters, period, are in Texas right now. Your area, Houston area, just, what? Because we're loud and angry. That's really that's really all it is. That's that's it, man. Like so, the I think you know here in Texas, uh, those guys up in Wichita, Kansas, are freaking badass. You know, the the conference that that put together. That's where I met uh, Scott Klein shit and uh, uh, Tom, uh, Hiddle for the first time. They came down here, and uh, yeah, dude, like there's some there's some badass firefighters in Texas. Like I I don't count myself one among them. I'm doing everybody is better than me. I'm there, there's some great dudes, way better dudes here than me, and I'm I'm learning from them. I've, I've met one firefighter my whole career that told me how good he was. Makes me think he's not a good fireman. <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably yeah. He's probably yeah. Not. yeah no, yeah, I've been struggling with energy lately, and I won't take any of those energy shots or energy drinks because they're so bad for you. Now, Magic Mind is a healthy blend of safe ingredients to help you have more productivity with less stress and more energy all without having those harmful chemicals that will make you feel like your heart's going to explode. It is a much safer and better choice with natural ingredients. Now, Magic Mind has hooked up all my listeners. So if you go to www.magicmind.co forward slash three point and put in the code 3.20, that's three, the number three, point, the numbers two and zero, you put that in, you will get 40% off your subscription for the next 10 days. Be sure to check it out. Well, I, you know, you probably look at me and go, wow, that guy's probably the greatest firefighter in the world. And you wouldn't be wrong, but you'll be interested to know <laughs> I started my career in Texas. I was in Wichita Falls, Texas. I will, I'll tell you. Yeah. A couple hours away from you. There you go. So that's, that's, you're welcome. Again, you can thank Texas for your service. <laughs> yeah, this is like Jason Pass. Patton told me he all that stuff on his walls is just thank me for my service for yeah <laughs> yeah no I all my see all my stuff is actually it's it's back here behind me on the it just yeah I haven't filled this room out oh, okay. yet but uh, we're working on it we're working on it so let's see we want to talk a little bit I don't know how do you how do you know somebody's a smoke diver if they're not wearing the hat or the shirt so yeah we we talked about that so. A crossfitter, a vegan, and a smoke diver walk into a bar, and how do you know? Because I told everybody in the first five minutes. They were there. <laughs> so that's a that's a real thing. That's that's the joke. Is you know in the colonies. Oh, hey, did you know that Justin was a smoke diver? Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> or the last week. Hey, did you know you're a smoke diver? I'm like I'm aware. I was there. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you heard uh, we you know my podcast with uh, the smoke daddy himself. Um, oh yeah. Is, okay, so. I think firefighting is like a subculture thing. And then underneath that, even a, a better, uh, in my opinion, uh, a better subculture would be uh, in fire instructors, not just people that have the, t the uh, certification, but people that actually teach. But I am learning yeah. that there is a dark, hidden gem of a subculture in the fire service, and it's smoke it, divers. That, that's called a cult. That's it, called, a, that's a okay, cult. It is a cult. It's, it's, it's if a if cult. you're wearing it's all cult. the logos all the time, then you're probably in a cult. It's a cult, huh? I didn't even realize until I actually just saw myself in my little corner thing that I'm actually wearing a smoke diver hat right now. So, so what made you want? But it, but it's all it's also the only clean one. But, so here's the thing. Here's what I know about smoke divers. It's an eight hour class. It's very easy. Most of it is classroom. Is Super that, is easy, that right? All classroom is absolutely accurate. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's it's probably the easiest thing I've ever done. I didn't cry at all. How many times did you have to go um, through? Did you just get, get it what first time? No, I, so I actually got injured in my first class, and it was a it was it was a freak deal. It was one hundred percent my fault, and uh, so I got injured on Tuesday, and they medically pulled me on Thursday, and I'm I'm glad they did. I was I was in tears. It was it, it sucked a whole lot. I just didn't want to quit. Um, then came back to the next class and got it done. Wow. So I just I dislocated a rib on Tuesday. Damn. So for those that aren't not or those that are not listening uh, try that again for those that are listening hey if you're not if you're not listening i got a great story for you <laughs> tell us about smoke divers what what got you involved in smoke divers when when did you first hear it and say yeah i want to torture myself so i had heard about the class long before i ever went um you know it was it was still in georgia at the time and texas had a program that ran for a short while and, um 
you know, they had a, a guy pass away there and um, they shut that program down and never in a million years did I think that it was something I was going to get a chance to do. And uh, one of the OG guys, um, Phil Chauvin, man, I'm going to mess it up. I think his number is 86, I believe. So he went back to the program back like 1980, something like that. Well, he moves out here in this, on this, this, this part of the world and uh, comes to talk to our fire chief and, you know, he's the one who convinced you know, you know, convinced Chief Thompson to let us go. So they're actually uh, at the training field that day, and he, uh, I'm like, who's the who's the toughest guys you got here today? And I wasn't one of them. It was it was the two other guys that actually made it the first time. And uh, but I heard, but they they got in the class, and I begged my way in, and and they let me in. So they they, you know, I just happened. One of them happened to be a a, a B shifter, and one was a C shifter, and I was on A shift mm-hmm. at the time. And I'm like, hey, I, here's an A shifter who wants to go. I want to go and. They uh they got me in and went and got it done, but we knew uh going into it we knew nothing. We were as ignorant as you could possibly be. We just knew that you know basically all we had was the videos that they had up at the time, um the the ones from 1980 something, and then the 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 four short videos that they had on the class, and then uh, we just kind of figured it out. So what? All of it. What the heck? You still there? I don't know. You went away. Anyway, so when it comes to the smoke diver program, what was the toughest thing for you? Was it the mental aspect or the physical aspect? I, I guess the physical aspect of it. I hated the runs. Like the runs, you know, the were, you know, they're not awful. I mean, they're not long. Whatever. I just hate running. I'm, I'm, I'm a bigger dude, so you know. If you get away from me in the first 40 yards, you deserve to live. And then I want you to run three miles there. And I just was not a fan of that. Um, but really just the mental aspect of it, the the performance level that's expected out of you. Um, there's, you know, there's a standard. They're going to hold the standard. Everybody's going to meet the standard or you don't, you know, complete the course. And uh, just being challenged at that level to, to be that, you know, fatigued, um, kind of beat down. Um, and then be able to perform at that level all week. That, that was probably the toughest part, but I, I loved it. The, again, you know, made it to day five, the morning of day five, my first class. And so getting ready to go back was, was probably, it's probably worse to go back and do it a second time because I just knew how much it was going to suck. Like this is, yeah, this, this is what's coming for me. Great. I thought it would make it easier. Yeah, it didn't make just, it easier. No, it didn't make it easier at all. It, it, because at that point, hey, you were successful this first time up to this point, and now you have to go do that again. Like, man, maybe I just got lucky the first time. Maybe I'm not that good. Like, there's there's a lot of doubt that creeps to your mind. And then again, just knowing how much suffering is coming is coming at you, and yeah, here we go. Let's you, get it on. Have you uh, heard of David Goggins? So, oh yeah. So you're in good company. He went through buds what three times. Man, I'm I'm not gonna compare uh, smoke diver to buds at all. Like I'm not gonna go there. Like that's a whole man. Those guys, that's a whole other level, man. But um, uh, yeah, no, it it yeah, you know what's coming, and it uh, it was it was just super fun. But it was it was really cool, man. Like I'm, I you know, the the when I got injured, I hung in there. Like I man, I, just, I hate I didn't want to quit. I don't know, like quitting like the two things I can't stand are liars and quitters and. So for me, that just wasn't an option, man. And when, when, when I actually got, you know, when I, when, when I went out on Thursday, like it was time to go out. I was, I was in a lot of pain. It sucked. Um, but you know, the, the, the guys in the program, like they did everything they could to try to keep me in class. They were, you know, I had guys over there trying to rub my shoulder down and try to put this rib back where it goes. And that sucked a whole lot. Um, <laughs> that sucked a whole lot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for helping. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but no, man, they were just, they were super supportive. They knew, they knew that I was, that I was in a lot of pain and that it was miserable, but they, like, they, man, they were a hundred percent, you know, supporting me and trying to keep me in the game, man. And, uh, man, the, I'm an intense guy. I'm a little bit emotional, uh, completing that thing. Like I, I tell people all the time, like if I could bottle that feeling, you know, the same thing, you know, with Victor, you know, getting hired, man, when you you come through the other side of that door. Like I, I tell you, hey man, when are you going to go smoke? I guess, ask guys all the time, guys, I think that would be you know, interested in it. And I 
push it because I want other people to feel that. I want I want them to know what that feels like, man. It's it's it really is special. I've always said that the fire service is one of the best things about the fire service is that you you reset your minimum every time. You don't realize what you can yeah. endure, what you can actually take physically and mentally until you're a firefighter. Sometimes you've got just fires that are not going out, big fires. You don't have a lot of people. Yeah. And you just you got to push through it. And uh, it seems to me, I, I haven't done it, obviously, but everybody I've talked to about smoke divers, it's resetting that minimum. They always say, I had no idea I could endure so much in such a short amount of time. And that alone was and there's a like, victory. Oh, that's, that's huge. I mean, and still... It's the absolute, it's the best search class I've ever been to. It's the absolute best writ class I've ever been to. The best, you know, firefighter survival class I've ever been to. I've never been to a better tick class. The the, the guys who teach ticks are unreal. And you're going to go in, in a burn building one-on-one -on -one with an instructor. And he's going to show you how this tick works, its capabilities and limitations inside that building. You're going to be required to do that over the course of the week. Um, the the leadership, the, you know, and you'll, you see it. So it's, it's, it's weird day one, man. You cannot tell you're looking like some studs that show up in this class because you know, and, and George is competitive to get in. And then, you know, the out of state candidates, they take the, the, the interest exam the day before the class and you essentially just have to pass it. And you see these just monsters out there and you cannot tell who's going to survive the week and who's not. And, you know, sometimes it's a physical a physical issue with somebody that they just can't do the PT or, or they're in their head. And then, you know, there's there's technical aspects of the class that guys can't come that don't complete that they you know, fail out of the class. And uh, it's just impressive to see, like, especially when you come back and start helping out with the class um, to see the opposite side, see the, you know, the behind the scenes of what goes on to make that class go on is just really impressive. It's, it's what you want the fire service to be. You know, we have a briefing in the morning. Hey, here's what's going to happen today. Here's what all needs to get built out. Everything gets built out that morning during, while they're there in PT and going on the run, you know, we progress through the class that day and it all gets torn down again at night. There's, you know, this this last class we had, I think we had 105 instructors on the ground and we finished with 24 candidates or 24 students. Um, there's nobody shamming. There's nobody bitching about the work they have to do. It's just, it's, it's an, an ant mound. Hey, go do this. Oh, they just attack this thing, make stuff happen. Class goes on. Oh, it gets torn down, down again. And the students never see that. And you'll, you'll come back the first few times you come back to help out. You're, I was more, I'm more tired going to work there as an instructor than I was, you know, as a student. Sure. Not nearly as beat up, but definitely, definitely tired. I, I'm getting winded just hearing about it. It's, 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 it's my Disney World. It's my Graceland. <laughs> That's where I go. All right. So we're wrapping up here. Let me ask you this. You, you, you do your teaching around and all that stuff. Tell me what you got on the agenda coming up. Where can we find you? So I'm um, going to be, I'll be at a Oklahoma Smoke Diver in February. So if you signed up for the Oklahoma class, you'll see me there. Um, the uh, Dad Gum Fire uh, Conference in Texas and other bears of the Oath Production. Um, and then I'll be uh, with Sean Duffy at, uh, oh my gosh, I can't believe I can't remember the name of this conference. Um, but it'll be in uh, Michigan in June. Um, well, I can't remember the name of it. I'm a terrible human. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that's that's for sure where I'll be. And I'm sure I'll uh, wind up somewhere between here and there. Fantastic, brother. One last thing. I like to end on this. Tell me the best firehouse prank that had been played on you or you played on somebody else. Man. Uh, this is, this is all right. So <laughs> we had a little war, this other department that I worked in between, between a, a shift and B shift. And so we, we, we didn't have, we weren't allowed to lock up our food. And so uh, B shift, they built this little, locker inside of their locker they can lock up their chips and whatnot because you know we would go in you know you can leave a hundred dollars on the yeah. kitchen table and it'll be fine but if you leave out a bag of chips or some ice cream like we're crushing <laughs> that so they, they built this little thing to lock their chips up so we built one to lock our bread and our chips up and we had this pink master lock on it so i come in the next tour or next shift and uh try to open up my lock and i can't get the combination lock to work like god dang it they changed the combination on the lock well so we cut this lock off. Well, they had just, somebody had left it unlocked. And so they bought a pink master lock 
you know, the same as the one that we had on there and locked our stuff up. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. So uh, I get with our EVT that day. I'm like, hey, man, how long are the leads on your welder? And he goes, I'm not going to let you do that, but here's some JB weld. So I JB welded the hasp down on there. So they're, you know, put the hasp down, it's metal on metal, and JB welded that together. And uh, so I think somebody ripped off a fingernail trying to get into their little chip container. <laughs> and so in, in retaliation, in retaliation, they uh, like uh, every single piece of clothing that I had in my locker back there, there were, uh, you know, women's sanitary pads in the crotches of all of my pants and shorts and uh, tampons and all the pockets everywhere. <laughs> like my pockets are just full of stuff. Everybody on our ship had all this stuff done to our locker. <laughs> so um, we, uh, I had gone to East Texas and like you know, where we work, you know, fireworks were not sold in this county that we work in, but they're sold everywhere else. And I came back with a bunch of black cats. And so I disassembled this string of black cats, took our grill apart and laid the, laid the uh, fuses for these black cats over where the burners were and then put the grill back together. And I had an inside man that day and my, like, Hey man, y'all need to grill something for lunch. And this dude needs to light it. And he said, Roger that. And I got a phone call about 1230 and it sounded like World War Three was happening. And they said when the first one went off, he didn't know he didn't know whether to shit or wind his watch. <laughs> and he, he hit the ground. It was dragging himself backwards on you know, with his elbows across the backyard trying to get away from this this grill that he thought was about to explode. So that was that was the end of that war. Um, a truce was called. <laughs> so I. I yeah, yeah, they call the truth at that point. I'm like, man, hey, man, you are Hezbollah and I'm Israel. I'm going to finish this shit. So uh, don't don't bring your weakness here. I will. I'm I'm going to win. But yeah. Wow. You got explosives and JB Weld in one good story, man. That's yeah, awesome. man, dude. Like, yeah, like I was willing to. I was going to drag welding leads. I was going to weld. Actually, weld that thing closed. And I guess you know, our EVT again had a good idea to not let you turn me loose with a welder inside of their food pantry, but. <laughs> The JB, the JB well got it. <laughs> oh gosh, I hope I'm hoping that you're giving firefighters around the country good ideas on how to handle other crews. Oh man, dude, I, dude, I, Rody, man, when his pranks, those, those were great. Like I'm, I'm, I might have to work on oh, some of that goodness. stuff. Well, you know, to me, the older guys got the best pranks, and then my favorite thing oh, yeah. is I have gotten off uh, podcast. And I said, okay, man, thanks for being on and all that. They go, okay, now I'm going to tell you the real I couldn't say this on the. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And then I tell them mine too. And they're like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we could just get away with more back in the day. I mean, I, I, did, I was a terrible fireman my first few years of the fire service. You know, I was, it, we, I worked at a really, really slow department. So we had to make up stuff to do. I learned how to make potato guns in the firehouse. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm evolving. Still going. We're always a work in progress, my huh, brother. <laughs> I got to tell you, I absolutely have enjoyed this. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. And I hope we stay in touch. Um, man, dude, I appreciate it so much. Thank you for having me on. Stay man. Safe. Today's podcast was sponsored by Fire Facilities, designers and manufacturers of realistic, built to last training structures and mobile units for 30 years. Make training count. Visit firefacilities.com for more information.